Five, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. Live from the heart of the downtown east side, it's Talk Recovery Radio with Giuseppe Gansi and Darren Gaylor on Vancouver's co-op radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. From the streets to the studio, bringing you addiction recovery stories from real people with lived experience and real experts on today's issues. Tune in live every Thursday, noon to one. Powered by New West Recovery. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. That's our cue. Good afternoon, Vancouver. Good afternoon to all the people online, wherever you are. It's Giuseppe Ganchi here and Mr. Darren Gaylor. Hey, Darren. Going on, Giuseppe. Hello, everybody. You know, keep busy. Got a little bit of rain here in our hometown, Vancouver, after a few months of no rain. So uh, I'm I'm happy for that and uh, glad to be here on Thursdays. You know, here on uh, Zoom, we'll be back in our studio hopefully one day. I mean, Darren, we're going to wear masks again. We're right. never going to get into the studio. <sighs> I know. You know. say it every week, and I'm just like, you know, you, oh, we're getting closer. It felt like I know, I know. I, getting closer, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm yeah. double vax. I, I'm pretty sure you are, too. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm at a place where... <sighs> You know, like I'm vax. I respect your right if you don't want to get vax. I don't really, I don't know. Like I just, I'm, I'm just really confused on how I feel about a world where we all have to be forced to get vaccinated and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I do believe my body, my right. Uh, I just, um, what a weird time. It, it, it is. I, I mean. I, I sort of sympathize with people I don't agree with, um, with just a simple understanding of never been in this position before, never had to make these decisions and had these choices uh, before. So I, I understand that that feeling of of, of freedom and, and and being forced and and you know being. Uh, against that like like I get it I think people are afraid and confused um I mean I I have my levels of distrust uh you know towards <laughs> the government yeah yeah you know, I, I just uh I you know I I just I make my own decision and, and I and I voice you know other opinions and other ideas for the purpose of feedback like, you know, to, to get more information, right? Like, I don't want to just absorb and commit to that information, you know? So I, I, I appreciate the other sides and the other versions. It, it's just hard not to jump on a specific bandwagon when you feel like you have to make a decision. You, yeah. need, you need to go with something. You need to believe in it. And you need to jump on the bandwagon and, and you know, to defend your decision. I, I'm just... About what do you what do you think of this though? It's what do you so you know the pandemic's caused a lot of harm. Like a lot of people have died, a lot of people have gotten sick. The addiction crisis has caused a lot of harm. <laughs> a lot of people have died. It, it, it's interesting. This might I need to figure out this piece that's going on in my head. It's like it's okay my body, my right to use as much drugs as I want and to be sitting on the street, homeless, completely covered in sores, street feet. And if you don't know what street feet are, it's, it's, it's really serious. Um, you know, with, you know, just, just not in good shape, your body, your right. But you know, COVID, it's like, nope, not your body, not your right. It, what, a, what is that? I don't know. Maybe I'm just not smart enough. I don't, like, to me, that is the epitome of stigma. You know, like, yeah. you're just a junkie. You're just a drug addict. Just sit there and destroy your life and family and everything. But you know what? COVID, well, yeah, that's I different. Mean, I, I just, there's maybe. something there, though. I mean, I tried to have this conversation with people um, because I'm trying to figure it out. I'm playing it out. It's like, why is it okay? Okay, 
I don't, and, and somebody's like, oh, well, the financial, like addiction mm-hmm. costs the Canadian economy billions of dollars, billions, not millions, billions. You know, families are destroyed. Um, but that's okay. You know, your body, you're right. Yeah. I, and I I'm that. double vaccinated and I think everyone should get vaccinated. I'm just mm-hmm. wondering what is the difference in attitude towards people who use drugs and alcohol with addiction? Mm-hmm. And somebody, you know, with COVID, it's just, it's, it's bothering me. Well, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a great, it's a great point. It, it provokes thought. I think they would just simply say that addiction doesn't spread. Like it's not. That's not know. true. Addict. I mean, there's a lot of research out there, the social contagion of addiction and recovery. And, you know, there's a lot of research out there that shows where there's addiction, addiction spreads and addiction grows and environmental. Yeah, there's some genetics and genes and there's bio, you know, research on, you know, that you, you have genes to be an alcoholic, who knows, but environment has a lot to do with your substance use. I mean, yeah. but I mean, an individual sitting in a group of 13 addicts isn't going to catch addiction. Right. Yep. That's that's what they're going to. I still counter that because a person with addiction sitting down there is costing us just as much money as you know what I mean? It's costing billions of dollars. It, there's a difference. And I, I just don't have it figured out yet um, or ever will get it figured out. Like, but there, there's something there. It's yeah. it's you know, minimizing the effect of addiction. I'm not, you know, you're my friend, I, I think, but that's what know. you're doing. You're minimizing. I think it you know. needs to be looked at as separate issues in, in so many ways. You know what I mean? But there are many comparisons. Like, I, I think there's, there's I mean, there's no way the solution is the same. You know what I mean? Like it requires, you know, very addiction specific solution via, you know, a contagion, right? All right. It's we got to get on with the show, Darren. We, we're, yeah. we're not going to figure it out here. Um, so we're going to get on with the show. You're listening to Talk Recovery Radio. We come to you live every Thursday, noon to one, Co-op Radio, 100.5 FM. And we are on Zoom because of what we've just been talking about, COVID. We're, we can't go to the studio, but this COVID world is working for us. We just had, uh, uh, just so we can get it, James has just disappeared from our Zoom room. So we'll we'll try to get him back online. But Darren, who are we talking recovery with today? Well, we get to talk recovery with uh, a couple of returning guests uh, on Talk Recovery uh, today. Uh, like Giuseppe was saying, Jim, oh, there's Jim. Uh, Jim's going to be uh, talking with us and uh, along with Patrick O'Neill uh, about a book they've co-authored, Writing Your Way to Recovery, How Stories Can Save Our Lives. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Happening. And welcome to the show, Jim. I just got on. I'm sorry, guys. I had something was happening with my darn thing, and virus kept popping up. I had to shut it down. So no good. viruses. We already got a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Sore subject, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. So, um, you know, obviously, some of these questions are are are, are to both of you, um, but let's. I mean, I'm just looking here. Uh, uh, let's start with uh, Jim Brown, uh, author of critically acclaimed memoirs, Apology to the Young Addict, I think we talked about on our show, uh, The Los Angeles Diaries, This River, a uh, recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship, goes on and on, Patrick O'Neill, uh, his memoir, Gun Needle Spoon, uh, he has a Master's of, of Fine Arts and Creative Writing, uh, on the board of directors for Redeemed, a nonprofit. Uh, I mean, you guys are like your authors now. You're not ex junkies. You're, you know, you're recipients of awards, and and I mean, I so- think they call that productive members of society. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, Pretty much. Let's, let's just. I, I love to to have our guests qualified and come on with so much success and 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 normalcy, shall we say. Uh, just to qualify, like, what was, you know, let's start with you, Jim, uh, you know, a quick summation or a day in the life of, of your addiction. Uh, well, I had a lot of days of life's an addiction here. Um, <laughs> but I started off when I was just a kid, um, marijuana 12, and then other substances, including heroin at 14. But my go-to was alcohol for the most part. And uh, I would start, you know, I'd start drinking. And when I started drinking, I started thinking about the powders. And after that, it was it was on. 
So, you know, I eventually, no, obviously, you know, it just, I got to a point where uh, I couldn't, uh, what does it say? I couldn't live without drinking. I couldn't drink without, and continue to live. Same deal with the using and through this path of, you know, the path, path of self-destruction. I was on it and just, you know, lucky I, (laughs) and more than luck, but I'm here. That you're alive to 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 write about it, and uh, and and obviously in this in this new book to invite others to to do the same. Uh, Patrick, quick little history of of your life. Uh, relatively same. Uh, start out at early age as as, as Jim. I uh, uh, smoking pot and taking acid and doing pills at a really young age, way too young, 12, 13, running the streets of uh, East Coast cities like Boston, New York. Uh, th- and then graduated to you know uh, uh, more obit- uh, uh, barbiturates and, and quaaludes and that kind of thing. And then I went to art school at a really age at seventeen, and two things happened. I always talk about this punk rock and, and heroin and uh you know and and heroin sort of took over and uh combination uh, yeah yeah (laughs) it was pretty good actually no and uh uh you know i mean drugs worked in those days and i mean that 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 we all use drugs for a reason at some point then they turn on us and they don't work and and so maybe three or four five years of a good time playing music and being in, in, in the punk scene and then another 15 17 years having a bad time and not knowing how to quit. And, and um, I went from being an art school musician, music industry to, you know, armed robberies, robbing banks, you know, going to prison. And that, that, that's, that's where my drugs, that's where my addiction took me. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was a pretty rough awakening at age 41 to be on the art of San Quentin looking around going, Ooh, how did this happen? You know, and I, I mean, I knew how it happened. I mean, you know, <laughs> that, that, that part was pretty self-evident, but it was sort of like, you know, like where, where, at what, what point did I just turn from being, you know, a creative person who loved beauty and art and things like that to, you know, right. to, to yeah. be armed robbery. And, and, you know, it, 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 it's, 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 it's just, it's just a testament to what, what drugs do, you know? Yeah. I, 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 I think a lot of us, if, if we sober up, you know, enough, we ask ourselves like, like, when did I give up on my dreams? Yeah. You know, yeah. like, like when did I, you know, yeah, it was, you know, drugs, I, I, I made sense to me, you know, starting out sometimes, but it's like, when, when did I actively decide to, to just do that? Yeah. And give up on my life. And, I, uh, you know, hopefully in, in, in writing our stories, we, we come to understand that. Um, so this book, writing your way to recovery, how stories can save our lives. Uh, you guys have co-authored this, mm-hmm. Um, clearly coming, you know, from a, a writing background and, and both doing your own memoirs. Um, what, what made you come up with, with the idea for this book? Um, you know, was it just in your own personal experience? Uh, you know, Patrick, do you want to take that answer or? Well, uh, Jim should take that answer because Jim came up with the book. Jim started this. Jim started this thing. I started it's all this, your huh? fault. Fifty percent chance on on asking the right guy. Yeah, funny, right? Right. <laughs> Jim, what was the idea? What- well, yeah, I finished Apology to the Young Addict, and I had, and I thought, well, what's what's my next project uh, going to be? And I, I wasn't sure. I mean, I, I've, I've pretty much exhausted my um, my past. I've used it up now. <laughs> and, you know, I got from, you know, well, you know, the Los Angeles Diaries, chronicling the beginning and you know, this river, um, chronicling the continuous c- continuation of what I started in the Los Angeles Diaries, pretty much, and some sobriety. And then the Apology to Young Addict, which deals mostly with sobriety. So what do I do next? Um, I just started jamming on the on the computer, thinking about stuff, and I still had stories to tell. Mm-hmm. And I'm just about retired. I got one more class to teach, Cal State San Bernardino, and then I'll be a free man. Um, and I've been teaching creative writing for 30 years, so yeah, I started to I started to think: Is there any way that creative writing might play a role in uh, recovery? And I thought, yeah, there's a lot of ideas there. There's a lot of things you could do. And so that was the that was the genesis of the of the beginning of the book was the concept of taking my experience as a drug addict and alcoholic and combining that with my experience as a professor and teaching creative writing. And um, so I thought that there were good exercises that I could do that would translate to issues of recovery. Got about fifty pages into it, 
And then I began to think, you know what? I just got my own take on this, on this puppy. But, uh, you know, I know a guy, his name's Patrick and we're good friends and he's been to the same place that I've been. And then some, and I thought, you know, I need another voice here. And so I invited Patrick to, you know, I, I showed Patrick some pages and he could talk about it a little, a little bit here. I showed him some pages, showed him what I, was, what I was up to and wanted to know if he wanted to, you know, to work on it with me. And thankfully he said, yes. And, uh, his contributions, man, they really took off. And, you know, you, as you can see, it's what he gave to the book is, is phenomenal. Cool. Cool. Pat, what, what, in, what inspired you, you know, when you had that, when you heard the idea? From Jim? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I, even, I think I even mentioned this in the book. I mean, I, I was in grad school reading, reading, reading Jim's books, you know, and, and I think I wrote some, some smart aleck uh, a review of it in Goodreads somewhere and, and Jim saw it and, uh, and we contacted then and it turns out we knew a lot of mutual same people. So it was like, it was like, it was like working with one of your heroes, you know, okay. and, uh, and, 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 it, and it was, and it, but it also was, it's like, it's like, you know, like Jim and I have both done this thing where we've uh, been, been uh, uh, we, we've helped, helped do book launches and stuff like that for each other and stuff like that you know like an interview with us you know thing like that and do those kind of things uh and so so we both know that we're on the same page we're on the same page there on, on, on the recovery team we both go to we both go to 12-step meetings we both do that kind of like that so it was, it was like it was like i can work i can work with this 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 this, this is this is like right right up my alley right like that and uh, uh interestingly enough we we were like it was seamless we, we just went in there and started working and it started it started just flowing and i think i think i i, I think jim and i really work really riffed off each other really well and, well, and, and like it's, because, it's there's yeah. a really interesting phenomena that happens when you start mm -hmm. recovery i remember my my first time in treatment mm -hmm. and uh, i didn't do therapy i didn't i didn't do uh, like i wasn't a uh, a practiced patient like i right, got right. caught smoking crack at work and they sent me to rehab and I, so i show up <laughs> and there's this thing called the steps and you have mm -hmm. to write right. stuff out and i did my step one in like a day right. and i handed it in because i was smart you know and i remember they shredded mm -hmm. it and uh they're like who does this in a day you're crazy right and and I, I learned the power of writing. Like mm -hmm. today I get it when it took me months to get that. Yeah. And so something happens. And, and when you write something out, because it's like, can't you do this verbally? Can't we do this PowerPoint? Like, what, what is all this? Mm -hmm. Right. And so I struggled with that and then I figured it out. So, so how does this help with that? Cause a lot of people that show up, this, this is a rehab center that puts on this show. Mm -hmm. Like how does writing help somebody? Um, what's in it what's in it what what is it uh i guess i'll take a stab at it and then maybe patrick can pick up um uh, well to tell you the truth there's a lot of things uh i just i spoke to a, a residential treatment some guys at the residential treatment center just a couple of days ago and they're they're going to be getting out and well most of them be getting out in staggered times but basically 30-day program and then they have to return home and, you know, they're in a safe environment when they're in uh, you know, the rehab. But what happens when they, you know, to get back to the neighborhood? Uh, what are the things you have to watch out for? What are the triggers? What are the thoughts uh, that be running through their heads? What are, you know, a lot of people, you know, we come back and there's some angry people you know, and we can make amends to them, but they're not necessarily going to be um, altogether happy with us. So we're going to deal with some fallout from other people as well. So I have an exercise in the book and, and Patrick mm -hmm. does as well about, right. You know, you can either choose to write from your personal experience or you can choose a character a creative character and he's coming back home. What's his first day like? Give me some details. Show me this guy coming home. Let's say it could be, you know, okay, here's, a, here's, here's, here's a scene. Uh, he gets back home. The day is over. Everybody's had their say with him. Now it's one o'clock in the morning. The house is quiet. And then suddenly this idea to get high comes across. Is that it comes, it comes, comes across. Um, what about when he gets into the car with his ex-wife, uh, with his uh, wife, girlfriend? What, you know, what's what's going to be her approach? So in a way, writing could help the recovering addict, the one who's getting right out of rehab, prepare psychologically and mentally for what they're up against, even if it's only a match. So that's just, yeah. 
idea of playing out the tape that you hear a lot about, like, you know, but not, not setting it up for a, a doom outcome, but mm -hmm. just what realistically, you know, are, are you, are you going to foresee happening? And, and I don't think, you know, like you say, I don't think we, we really look that far beyond. Maybe we're scared. Maybe we're, you know, we, we just sit in this expectation that it's all going to go bad or, in denial that it's all you know everything's going to work out just fine but to really like yeah like a couple of days ahead a week ahead you know what what does that 20 minute car ride look like with with you know with your current <laughs> partner that you know with all the conversations left unsaid while you're in treatment you know like what's the first thing that's going to brought up i yeah. i could come up with the first thing she's going to tell <laughs> you know what I mean? and and i and and so in that the individual is kind of planning a response or you know yeah sure. setting, a, setting a realistic expectation so we say yeah right yeah. right and you just said play the tape through matter of fact I'll just pass this over to Patrick because he has a piece in the book called "Play the Tape Through." I oh, there you yeah. go. Yeah, absolutely. It was some. It was something actually. One of my counselors told me that you know because I was thinking about getting high, and he's like, "We'll play the tape all the way through." I go, what, "What the hell does that mean? You know, come on, man." You know, he's like, "No, go go to the end. Go to that looks like." And I knew what that end looked like. You know, I've done it a million times. You know, so it, it it's just there like that. The one thing about the the the, the, the what the book is that you know I, I know that but Jim write his books with me by my book. There were certain areas where like stuff we never wanted to tell people, like really kind of deep stuff that was like you know embarrassing or just that you know just didn't put us in a good light, which is pretty hard to look be in a good light for half the stuff we write about, you know. But I mean the, the kind of stuff you put it you put it out there, you write it, you get it done, and it's cathartic, man. You 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 kind of put it to bed, you know. And I I have this thing with the, with the, you know the, the greatest hits of my, the worst things I ever did playing in my head at night all the time, like you know like 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 on 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 on, on loop, you know. And uh, uh, the ones that I've written extensively about, they're, they're no longer they're no longer part of that repertoire. You know, I'm, I'm kind of done with them. I put them away. I've worked through them and stuff like that. And then that, that was one of the kind of things we're kind of like, how can we get, how can we get people in there? And, and you know, and then what it really came down to is finding the right prompts. And, and with the beautiful, beautiful part is there's a whole bunch of things going on in, in especially in A meetings where everybody's arguing about the damn thing. Is there God? Is there not God? You know, what, what's relapse look like? You know, all these kind of things like that. So that they were already tailor made for us to go and make make a like a, a really good prompt to so people come into like that because they're already controversy and they're already starting starting like a conversation we can get into and we all have our own take on them and stuff like that. You know, so it, it's really a. a you know, it's, it, 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 you know, it's, I'm, I'm stumbling about it, but it, it takes like the idea of journaling and step work just a little bit further into making it personal. Not that step work isn't personal. <laughs> let's, let's not say that, but you know, like a story that, 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 you know, that, you know, cause, cause we're telling, we're already telling ourselves stories. We're already telling our stories what a piece of crap we are, so on and so forth, how bad we are. We'll never, no one ever, ever love again and all those kinds of things like that. But this is the story of, uh, you know, and I want to use the word redemption. You know, and, and 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 working your way through these things, and that that that's what that's what that's that's the save our lives idea. You know, I, and I, and I think as you explain that, like, it's such a level of self respect that 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 guy can give himself by by writing, you know, the the real story down, like yeah. the ugliness yep. and, and yeah. the despair, and and you know those mm -hmm. that were hurt, like. I think Gi Giuseppe touched on, I mean, I've been to 13 treatment centers before okay. I, I'd gotten clean mm -hmm. and I, I mean, I was institutionalized, you know, I knew how to get through, I knew how to oh. answer the questions based on what the book might say or the, mm -hmm. what everybody mm -hmm. else says. Yeah. Very generalized. Mm -hmm. So when I got into, you know, the step fours and, and, and the areas where it's like, you know, make it personal. I'm still generalizing my answers. I'm generalizing right. Right. my level of self-centeredness and I'm writing it in a third person sort of mm -hmm. you know, book definition of self-centered. I'm not yeah. even attached to that definition. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I remember hearing a psychotherapist describe, you know, the, the, ne the necessity of uh, specificity, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you yeah. know, that yeah. individual has to be specific about mm -hmm. smells, colors, taste, yeah. Yeah. feelings, you know, like if he's recalling a memory, you know, what was the weather like? Mm -hmm. Who was there? What were you wearing? Like, and how much, like you say, catharticism, yeah. you know, 
is brought about in that. So, I mean, I love and support the idea and uh, of, of writing your own story, writing your own memoir. Now, does it, does it, does it matter what, how soon somebody gets into that? Like, there's also the <laughs> argument of like too much, too soon, you know, too much to take on too much remembering too much detail. Yeah. And is that a trigger? And what, what's your guys' just personal thoughts on when should somebody really get into it? Um, well, uh, Patrick warns about this. That's one of the things Patrick brought to the book is I, I, I didn't think about what you just said. I didn't okay. think about, you know, taking somebody back and, and everything you just said too about remembering colors, smells, oh, yeah. uh, people, what they said, all that's part of being a good fiction writer or being a writer, period. Right and on, yeah. th that goes, and so that, that plays in beautifully to the idea of our book. And let me digress for a second. Um, when we, before we go into an exercise, and we keep our exercises fairly brief, we tell a personal story about ourselves. Uh, for instance, I have one where I mean, my car automatically drove me into the parking lot of a liquor store. Okay? <laughs> I was on autopilot <laughs> and I had no control. And, you know, I did not drink that time. All right. I did not drink, but it came very close. And I had, uh, I think only 90 days of sobriety. I forgot what I put in the book. I think it's 90 days. But in any event, so we have a personal story, kind of like what we do in AA or NA. And then, but this one's followed by, okay, I shared mine with you. Now it's your turn to, to share your own or make a fictional character because it's some distance and some freedom and some safety if you want it. Um, but back to that other question, um, that you just said, yeah, uh, there's a risk. And Patrick pointed that out to me that you can only go so far sometimes, depending on what your state of mind is, before you might be pushing yourself into a relapse if you remember too intensely, and if it's too hard to remember, if it's too painful to remember. And Patrick's the one who said, well, you know, you might have to pause here, you might have to stop. But I, I'll, let, I'll let Patrick pick up on that because that was a detail I didn't think about. And it was so oh, yeah. important that he brought it into the picture that you have. The, the beauty of co-authoring something, you know. Right, 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 right. Awesome. Well, you know, for, for me, I, I just remember, like, there's a couple, there's a couple, I, I, I did chapters of, of there, were, there were kind of extended scenes for Gun, Needle, Spoon. And there, there was a couple of them that, you know, it took me a while to get through. And so I wasn't just writing that and done with it. I'm all good. You're like this. This was like a week out or so on a chapter. And, you know, it'd be like, you know, a horrific scene where, you know, somebody died or, or you know, a, a hardcore robbery or something like that. And, you know, I would write a piece of it and then be stuck with it. And there it's nighttime and there we are, you know, and I get to think about it all night. The next day, the next day, the next day. And I realized that, that, you know, we are asking some people and who knows what level they're going to be at in their recovery. We're asking people like to come jump into your memories. Aha, it's a great time. Come, come on. You know, <laughs> it might not be. And so a lot of it, we, and we, we touch on this a whole bunch throughout the book, self-care, man. Take care of yourself. Call somebody. Go to a meeting. You know, if you don't go to meetings, do something else. Get a friend. Get somebody you can talk to. Those kind of things like that. Because it is going to bring up a lot of stuff. And we all know it, man. You know, like, you know, we, we can sit here and and, and do the polished version, which is all nice. Like this cool thing happened, like a, you know, a drug log kind of story where we can get down the nitty gritty and really talk about what happened. And that, that's where, that's where the, that's where the writing really happens. And, and that stuff you, you need, you need support. You really need support. Just like we need support getting, getting clean, you know, same thing. Absolutely. I, I mean, that's, it, it, it's, it's something that to be said about, you know, being, surrounded by a, a network of, of people yeah. while you're doing your individual work Absolutely. while you're getting messy in that one hour counseling session say you know to not just walk out the door mm -hmm. and, and you know pretend nothing happened and leave right. it all there I don't think we can do that I don't mm -hmm. think I don't think we should do that I, I think you know that's that's the moment where we need to reach out and and say yeah I just I just went into detail about some really ugly stuff yeah. like can yeah. we just hang out for a bit and right. there's also the need to be creative in your recovery journey i mean mm -hmm. you know people have step groups and they have traditions groups and there's always that conversation like you know mm -hmm. we're doing steps every year and all that kind of stuff this is an opportunity where you can still practice mm -hmm. creative writing and and that's part of your recovery journey and how is this helping you in your recovery and so forth so also about the book you know we're talking about how stories can 
can save our lives, writing your way to recovery. So when somebody gets the book and reads the book, does it also uh, uh, you know, give pointers on how to do creative writing? Is this something like how to meditate? You know, like, you know, because I, I, I don't still don't know how to meditate. So is this, you know, some people that they, they're forced to write their step work by sponsors. And now, you know, how does one become a creative writer? Um, you know, when it's hard for them to even do a journal. So does this give pointers on that as well? I think so. Yeah, we have a lot of pointers in there, and we 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 don't. I don't think I don't want to use the we. I say I because I don't. I can't speak for anybody but myself. I didn't. I I've taught for thirty years, and I know that um, uh, you know I I need to give some guidelines, some structure, some um, a point of view on. Um, an exercise I might have. So I give the students details about, um, uh, you know, what should go into this exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and I keep it open though, because I, I want them to have the freedom to express themselves. So it's basically point them in the right direction based on a, you know, a personal experience that I had, then they can replicate that experience in, in, you know, from their own point of view and own experience, going back to like driving on autopilot back into the liquor store. You know, I think we've all been there. Uh, we're we're going to relapse. We're about to relapse, and um, there's a got to there has to have been some point where we were about to relapse, and then we chose not to pick up and use. So in that exercise, I say, you know, okay, you can. I want you to take your, you know, uh, where you had a close call, where you went to the dope man's house, and you bought the bag, and you walked out to the car, and Imagine yourself going through those steps, but I want in this exercise, I don't want you to use, even if in real life you did, I want you in this exercise to say, no, the, the dope went out the window, the, you know, the, the booze went in the trash can. Uh, this time I had success. This time I had some power. So replicating that experience, um, I think it strengthened, uh, give a right, give a writer, give a writer and an alcoholic and a drug addict some strength and that's kind of what we're after i think yeah that's cool because like i was saying before like we are our, our minds are sort of set you know if you're a relapser it's just that's what's going to happen no matter what and and even just to like you know create a situation and then change it i i think one can realize like that actually can happen in real life i could actually you know say yeah. no or stop yeah. it there or take a left instead of the right you know that's that's an interesting concept you know that it's not just you know simply making up a story you know? right like I, I i i know for me like I, I mean my english is good i i i i've no i know how to write i'm not dyslexic but i remember i mean literally physically my arm hurt just from writing for an hour and how frustrated that made me and 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 how i would i would shorten what i was doing you know like on purpose and and i think that just the exercise in writing period just to start moving the pen moving some thoughts i mean is a great way if you if, if there's some hesitancy to you know to writing you know the all the truth down right um which I guess both of you guys with your own personal memoirs out, we may have discussed this on, on, on our, our first interview, but like, what was it when you knew you could go public or you could, you know, write the absolute truth and the ugly out and, and let it go, you know, and, and share it with everybody. Like what, what was it that was, that gave you that notion that you were ready to do that and you weren't going to sort of fold under the, the truth being out there is that for me right. both of you yes. yeah both definitely you. um well patrick why don't you pick this one up and then why why think of an answer okay <laughs> <laughs> nice well i mean i'll, I'll say this and I'll, I'll say this i was i was in grad school reading reading jerry Stahl's permanent midnight re reading jim's uh, uh la diaries and a few other books uh, uh, that, that I'm not not uh, not thinking of right at the moment, and and realizing, hey, I can do this. You know, these guys did it. I mean, I mean, I mean, read Jerry Saul's book. I mean, that guy just says here, this 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 is me and all my ugliness, man. You know, I mean, there's one scene I always talk about. That I use it when I teach college. I use it, you know, 
where 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 he goes and cops uh, in a, in, a, in a like a, a shooting gallery with all these like this discrepant people at three a.m. in the morning, and he's got his six month old baby with him, and and it, and it's like it's, it's amazing, and there's, and then this crackhead woman is like who's got weeping sores goes, let me hold the baby, and he and he goes, oh hell no, and she goes, oh you think you're better than me? I didn't bring no baby down here. It's like <laughs> awesome, man. It's awesome. It's like oh, punch in the gut, you know. Yeah. And, you know, so so that gave me permission there, you know. But what, but but you know, I still my first draft. I, I was I wrote 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 my uh, my 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 uh, half of my uh, my book is in my thesis for grad school, and my first first beginning my first drafts, I was writing so I I, I kind of made myself look good, you know. And people were looking at going, this is like you telling me a story, but you're not telling me. I don't I don't see and there's none of you in it, none of you whatsoever in it. And I really didn't know what that meant, you know, and and then and, and I was started getting deeper into it and started writing and writing about it. And and that that's that's when I, I realized that that, that you know the, the, the dynamic of the whole situation is what makes it readable. That's why I wanted to read Jerry Stoll's books and it's like that. That's why I want to read Jim's books. There's a dynamic there that's like, you know, I want to know what this guy's how bad this guy is gonna get. I want to know what's gonna happen there. And the, okay. so the, the the permission was was you know, when I really felt comfortable with that. Was 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 it was it you know like like it, you know I I don't want to I don't want to just lie about this stuff I want to put it out there you know, like that now I'll be honest the first couple of times getting out there you know or my you know my mom buying my book and stuff like that and not I'm not not super happy about it like that <laughs> thankfully my first book came out in French <laughs> you know, okay I was published in French for France first my mom couldn't read it I gave her a book no problem you know <laughs> but I th I think I think that's it I mean I mean it's 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 what you already touched on it, Darren. Was was like, why do it half assed? You know, go yeah. go do it. Go go get the work done because you don't want to do this again. Just like step work, you don't want to do that stuff again. You know, so 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 kick ass and do it. What do you right. got? What do you, Jamie? Got something now? Uh, I, I I think so. Um, uh, when I, I I lost about nine years, why well, couldn't I couldn't write um, because I was too busy and wrapped up my addiction. And what the addiction took from me, uh, well, it took a lot, uh, not just the physical toll, but it took, you know, it, it took what you guys know it takes. It takes your self-confidence. Yeah. It takes away your sense of self-esteem. Uh, you've lost your sense of decency. And you're trying to get it back. You've lost, um, uh, well, I was full of self-loathing. There were so many things working against me. And like I said, for nine years, I didn't write a word. Yeah. And when I finally began to get sober and get some sober time under my belt. And uh, it was very hard to go back to writing because I didn't have any confidence in myself. And every time I wrote a sentence, it was terrible. And, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't believe in myself. I lost the belief in myself. I had such a low opinion of myself because of what I, you know, of all my screw ups. And, and then, uh, you know, my, my woman who's now my second wife, she was looking over my shoulder and she, would say, no, no, well, you know, oh, wait, wait, let me back up a second here. There's a step I missed. There was a friend of mine when I tried to begin to write again, and he said, Jim, why don't you just tell the truth about your life? Because I've written some novels beforehand, and they, hey. they were autobiographical novels. And he said, why don't you just strip it all away and quit screwing around and just tell the truth? Because anything, there's nothing you can't make up that, you say something to the fact that yeah. you can't make up anything better than what you lived. And so, you know, I, I thought, yeah, it was a good point. And, and so I thought, I'm going to tell the truth to the best of my abilities about what happened. And, you know, I didn't even care about getting published. I didn't think about our audience. I didn't think about how anybody was going to respond to it. I just wanted to tell the truth to the best of my abilities. That was the Los Angeles Diaries. So I just stripped away any pretense cool. of possible publication, any pretense of, you know, of hoping that people will think better of me because of it. And just try to tell my truth. Well, and there's so there's so much freedom when you just share your story. I mean, I always tell people, I don't know too many people that have died because they've told the world that they're in recovery and that they're living recovery. I know a lot of people that are dead that you yeah. know kept their addiction yeah. and their recovery quiet, and and so no one knew. And 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 so there's there's a lot of power in sharing our stories, and sharing your stories is powerful. And you know, we love having you on the show. Uh, this is the second time, and with your new book. So thank you very much for being on our 
our show Thank and uh, best wishes with the, the journey of creative writing. I mean, we, we, we need to show people that creative writing has lots of power. Do it in your steps, but also you can use, do it in this book as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, man. Thanks, Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very Appreciate much. It. Appreciate it, man. And a link to your guys' websites and, and how to get the book it will be uh, on our Talk Recovery page. Thanks again for coming, guys. Love the All idea. Right. Yeah, we just right. finished talking with uh, James and Neil. The book is called, no, Neil's our next guest. Sorry about that. We just finished talking, <laughs> Writing Your Way to Recovery, How Stories Can Save Our Lives. Jim Brown and Patrick O'Neill, you can get that on our, on our website and uh, you can get that on Amazon and other bookstores. Thanks for being on the show, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take it easy, Thanks. man. Hey, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, we're moving on with Talk Recovery Radio, coming to you live every Thursday noon to 1. And uh, you're listening to Vancouver Co-op Radio, uh, 100.5 FM, powered by New West Recovery. And uh, we're going on to our next guest here. Hello, Neil. How are you? Good. Thank you. And thanks for having me on the show today. Yeah, definitely. Welcome to the show. And we're excited to have you on here because I love this topic. Uh, Family Recovery Society is the organization that you, uh, I believe, are, are a board member of. You sit on the board? Yes, I sit on the board. I'm on the outreach and uh, events, and I'm also like a representative uh, for the dads group on the board. Excellent. we got a dad on the show. we got yeah. two dads on the show. Darren's a dad. I'm not a dad. I'm, 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 I'm an Uncle G, which makes me super happy. And uh, yeah. uh, you know what? I, 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 I just absolutely love the way recovery has changed my life um, to include family because uh, I didn't talk to my family for years before I came uh, into recovery and, and now uh, make it a priority. So, Neil, um, mm. you know, how did you get involved in Families Recovery Society? And what is Families Recovery Society? Well, Family Recovery Society began as a Facebook group for mothers in uh, recovery in New Westminster. And, you know, throughout like the last like the pandemic and the, you know, the COVID and overdose crisis, the the need for um, mothers and fathers in recovery, it it jumped to 50 percent. for like and what they do is like relapse relapse prevention programs um through the red cross um how i got involved was you know i went to treatment um last door uh you know 20 months ago was yesterday and you know when i was leaving that uh, the treatment center i wanted to like be more part of like a father and help out dads to get and to move on with their journey uh, with their kids and enjoy recovery with their families and you know as i like got through that the um i had got a phone call from francis stone which is the uh the founder of the family recovery society and asked me to join or to start a father's or a dad's group on facebook so every monday night we have a speaker meeting at seven o'clock with and then a 30 minute share portion of that and you know that like to me that it, it gives me passion and recovery to like help another dad um, be able to see his child or, you know, how do I co-parent with somebody, you know, like with all the dads that are in the group, it helps me like move forward and see other dads, like enjoy, um, that part of their life again, you know, and be able to cherish those little moments that you, you can share with your children. Um, but as like, uh, as the family and recovery society has grown, we've, you know, we're, we're now going to be at uh, recovery day, which is super awesome. And feel free to come and get connected with us. You can also check us out on the, on our website for uh, family recovery society.com, um, which is our, or join us on our Facebook groups for moms or dads. So there's one thing that like I, I learned, you know, after being in recovery for a bit, I didn't know the difference between like being a dad and being a father and being yeah. a parent or just being a, you know, I didn't, yeah. I mean, I, I, I knew, you know, good dad, bad dad, good mom, yeah. bad mom. <laughs> yeah. And I don't mean bad mom as you're a bad person. Yeah. I, I like my own like subtle, naive, just, you know bubblegum kind of definitions of words you know I never thought of it and then I came into recovery and I and I saw fathers and mothers 
making amends and sharing stories, you know, how they're, how they weren't there for their kids. And, and, and it started to like dawn on me, like my relationship with my father, you yeah. know, and, and how like, like, I, I mean, I loved my dad, he's passed away, but I remember hating my dad, right? <laughs> and uh, like it took, and then one day it's just like, I, I mean, I don't have a bit of hate anywhere in there. So like, how does this Family Recovery Society help with that? You do your stories and personal stories. Your relationship with your kids, let's talk about you. Um, okay. How has recovery changed that relationship with your kids? So, you know, go, so ever it's not going to start like back when like my first, I was still in addiction and I'd have my, you know, I had my kids thinking that like having a child was going to stop that progression of my addiction, which it might've stopped it for a month, but it continued on. I have three beautiful children and a very supportive wife today that, you know, as I was doing every child, I thought, oh, I'm going to be able to stop. And, you know, when it was come down to it, my addiction got a lot worse, but, you know, I wasn't present for them. I was there. I was a good dad, but I wasn't there, there for them as much as I could be, you know, and after like doing, you know, the 12 step program, doing, you know, everything, I go to meetings, I sponsor, I do all that stuff. And like today, you know, I'm there for them on a regular basis. I'm there present for them when they need me to be there for them. You know, I have one little story. Like I went camping the other week and my daughter, she was, we were walking down and she just held my hand and I had this like spiritual awakening moment of like how walking down here right now with her clean and sober and just enjoying the moment while we just hold hands and go pick wood out of for a campfire. You know, th that is something I didn't, really take as much consideration in every when I was using it was more like when can I get my next you know when am I going to use again how like when my next beer is going to happen whatever and now it's like I don't have to think about that anymore I I just think about like where's our next adventure going to be like where am I going to take my kids to the woods teach them a bunch of stuff that you know that will, they'll hold and cherish in their memories for you know the rest of their lives because we all know that as our parents showed us one time, we have memories of like, you know, going to a hockey rink or going fishing or, you know, anything. And those little memories that you make with your parents are something that you hold on and you share to the next generation. And that, that's one of the things too, is like, I want my next generation to carry on knowing that, you know, I, I survive recovery right now and that I can help my kids grow. And if something happens to them, I can teach them the tools I learned uh, in recovery to so preventive of like measures for me you know yeah and, um, and, and not to not to be it in, in a way where it's like oh because I'm abstinent you know uh, that makes me a better dad than yeah than the guy that that's you know three beers in down at the river with his kids uh, yeah you know to each their own but I I think you know in in the groups that we've we participate in yeah. I mean, for me that that like life of normalcy uh, of three beers in and and still being a present and 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 mindful father is non-existent and yeah. and I know that right yeah. and uh, you know like when, when you know the times like uh, shout out to to Francis Stone first off like she was our <laughs> our co-host for what five years with yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and and I think you know like this was one of her her passion projects that she had in the back of her mind that uh, she, you know, wanted to create this, uh, this, this family, um, uh, you know, society and, and people in recovery and helping each other. And, um, you know, it's, it's gotten down to, you know, moms and, and, and dads now specifically. And uh, full disclosure, I've, I, I came in pretty quickly, I think from, from the beginning yeah. and, and uh, have been, an active participant in it um oh you go to family recovery society meetings darren i, I yeah. go well i do the dads he does the that one. Oh, yeah. oh, nice. i didn't know that yeah, i thought yeah. i knew everything so, about you <laughs> so I, I mean francis sent me a message you know asking me like you know if i could be of support and 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 share my story and i think Giuseppe, wow. what i found out is that being the interviewer for seven years on a show i had this yearning to like you know, share my own story, right? Yeah, so yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. And 
I hadn't spoken about the relationship with my daughter, you know, through addiction, um, and, 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 you know, the, the duality of having her that experienced my addiction and my two kids that have only known me in recovery. And, and, and it brought up some feelings and, and it was, it was cathartic for me in a way. Um, so that, so I, you know, I wanted to return and return and, and the new dads that are sharing the stories of like just head in hands. I can't believe I did this. Um, gave me a sense, like, I don't know if you've noticed this, Neil, or maybe you've said it yourself. I know I've said it like where it's just like, I slumped down. I can't believe this happened. I can't believe yeah. I abandoned my daughter. And, and yeah. just in that narrative alone is like saying, I should have been stronger than addiction. Like you describing, you know, the thought of the next drink and, you know, like rather than your kids, like how should that be a surprise? If I know addiction, like and understand it that should be that should be responded with well exactly yeah. like exactly <laughs> i i paid more attention to to dope and booze than my own kid like completely uh you know did i com like detach um and distract myself from from any type of parenting role like i i think that's a mutual understanding of anybody that's that's been through addiction and, and have also had, had kids. Right. And, and that yeah. there needs to be a, a, like a level of support, like, like, dude, don't get too hard on yourself here. Like, unless you're the one guy that thinks he should have been able to defeat addiction all on its own because of the, you know, he had a kid, <laughs> then you've, you're an individual man, you know, because <laughs> I, I think a lot of it, a lot of the times external forces can make us stop for a little while, but it, it I mean, yeah, like it doesn't change who we are. That requires, no. a, you know. Yeah. It definitely doesn't change who we are. Like, it, like for me, like even like this group has brought me a connection with like dads from, you know, New West Recovery uh, to dads in Manitoba, to dads in Ontario, to dads okay. all over using this dads group and to connect. And, you know, it's not, it doesn't just stop at dads group for me either. It's, it, I continue to like, you know, talk to them over like messenger or, you know, phone calls or whatever, because, you know, it's just a new passion now that like to be able to like help a dad or guide him, support him. And, you know, with the people in the group too, that are there every week, we, we all come from different ways. Like we learn how to co-parent, we learn how to like get our killed children back again. And, you know, I'm one person, but as a group of dads, we can help that individual that needs that certain path to live and move forward in their life and to like, you know, expand their journey that they've already started, you know, the 12 step doing that first set of steps is the first part. And that's learning how to love yourself. And the next part of that is when you have kids, you learn how to love them as well as yourself more. You know what I mean? Like, it's just something that like, you know, I'm very, very passionate about. And I love that we can get together and have barbecues and, you know, as a family, as a like family recovery society, getting together, meeting other dads, being social, having the kids hang out, because that was something that, you know, I also sponsor guys in the house, but like, it was hard for me to like go after a meeting to go hang out with, you know, uh, just regular guys. I had a family to take care of now, man. I was gone forever with them. And now I'm here, I'm present. I want to be here for them. And this group allows me to like bring my kids with me to meet other kids or other dads in recovery and their, and their old children, you know, it's, but this it's is so experience. this is so important. I'll tell you why oh, yeah. this is so important. And, and I mean, uh, please, if you're listening to the show, you know, visit their Facebook page, their website, give them a like. Families Recovery Society. They're online as well. They're in the link. If you click on the link on this show, you can get to their uh, their web presence. But support them because this is why relapse is a chronic relapsing disease. They say, mm -hmm. you know, and so 
early recovery is probably something the government should be investing millions of dollars in because we can help people get clean and sober, you know, with interventions and treatment. But if we don't invest in helping them in early recovery, family dynamics can be so triggering, you know, co-parenting. I don't see any government money really going into co-parenting groups. It's like, how do you co-parent when you're two months clean, you know, without proper support and, and, and like that needs to be invested in. I mean, we're throwing so much money, which we need to into harm reduction into trying to save lives, but hello, like, why don't we also invest just as much money in keeping people clean and sober by providing services such like your family support group. I know yeah. Frances story. I mean, she gets a little bit of money, but it's crumbs. I mean, it's a little yeah. bit, literally crumbs. So make a donation because if we can help people co-parent, if we can help people understand family dynamics and how you don't have to use because you got in a fight at Christmas, dinner you know with your family uh, which is you know we laugh about it but it's an actual true story <laughs> true. Yeah. you know what i mean like it happens and and because you know f- programs have a really hard time funding family programs because there's no government money for it so if you're listening you know contact your 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 mps you know it's an election time right now so you know what are you investing in to have recovery oriented assistance of care for families you know what are you and i'll tell you what the answer is going to be a nothing you know and so we need to change that conversation and so it's really important what you guys do number one you're putting a smile on kids faces so that's like the number one reason we're like i'm glad that you do this and we're giving you space but number two we need to be advocates in our own right because early recovery is so underfunded and we need to support people in early recovery so congratulations on your monday meetings how does a dad become part of and how does a mom become part of so so dad or mom can be part of like you join a our facebook group and it's a private group so in that private group we have our speaker portion of the meeting is available because we all know dads and moms are busy and we can't always make the meeting. So that speaker portion is just like a podcast sort of uh, video that you can watch later on, like when you come home from work or, you know, you just need to listen to a story from a dad in recovery or mother in recovery. So join us on our Facebook book, our face, uh, Facebook page, which is dads in recovery society or family and recovery society. And I'll send you to that link. And like you're saying, just be like, I, to get that funding is important because when I came into recovery, I was, um, I, we, my family emptied our bank accounts. I got rid of all my RSPs, all our savings just for me to go to treatment because we knew that we needed it. And my family would do it. My wife, you know, did her best to get as much money as we could. And without the donation, I'm not sure if I'd be here today because the last store got me a donation. And with that, I was able to continue and finish my program. And I am here sitting with you guys today, starting a, you know, a different journey and helping out other people in my recovery because of that, you know, what was given to me is now I'm giving back as much as I can, because that's important to me, man. That like warms my heart. And I just hope that the MPs and, and all the higher powers like P can help us out in this recovery that we need, because the overdose crisis is a real thing and it needs to be of like, it needs to be uh, fixed, you know, as much as we can. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing your story. Right on, Neil. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I mean, this is, and and until it's, it is recognized, we'll, we'll, you know, we just got, got to have people like yourself and and participants, uh, you know, people that are willing to do it. Like that's, I mean, the community you know, involved in what's going on behind the scenes yet to be recognized as, as a viable solution is happening. And, and through this show and, and, and that group, like we invite, you know, anybody struggling and, and looking for some support in, in the areas of, of family and, and co-parenting and fathering, mothering, uh, look us up and, and check it out. Neil, thanks buddy. Thanks guys. Thanks for being on our show. Thank you. And, Thanks for having uh, me. Click on the link in the comments and uh, you can uh, follow our first guest um, and uh, learn how to be a creative writer in recovery. Awesome book. That was a great show uh, with them. And Neil, appreciate you. And uh, if you're looking at this crowd behind me, uh, it's Recovery Day. That's from 2019. We're going to do it again this year. We got the green light, even with all this COVID stuff and vaccine passports. 
recovery days on September 11th. Vaccine passports are on September 13th. So if you want to enjoy some freedom, come to recovery day on September 11th. Uptown New West, six and six. We got food trucks, clowns, kids zone, bands, music. You, it's going to be everything. Got information booths. And you know what? If you're a recovery ally, come to. And also, you know, if you have a loved one that's uh, using and you need some information, there's going to be 80 information booths of mental health and addiction services that are local to Metro Vancouver. Come ask questions. Come find out uh, about uh, recovery uh, September 11th. Darren, always good to see you. See you next Thursday. Neil, keep on. Thank you. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye.